Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to uh, the platform of the University of the Philippines. Today, we are going to tackle a very important issue, which is the ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. We will hear bits and pieces of opinions, analysis, their recommendations on the ASEAN and in the context of the Philippines' participation in the ASEAN, no less than from our own Filipino experts on diplomacy and on the ASEAN. So, uh, I am Edna Ko from the National College of Public Administration and Governance and from the UP Center for Integrative and Development Studies. Let us hear now from our experts, but first, I'd like to introduce to you our panel of experts on the ASEAN today. On my right-hand side, immediately, we have former Ambassador Delia Albert, and she will talk more about herself before giving her own opinion on the ASEAN. We have Dr. June Oriarte, Filimon Oriarte Jr., and of course, a former Secretary, former Senator, and former Philippine Ambassador to the ASEAN, Orlando Mercado. So, uh, good morning, um, gentlemen and uh, madam. Let me uh, introduce, uh, let me allow you to introduce yourselves some more in addition to how I have introduced you earlier. Uh, Ambassador Delia Albert, please. Well, I'm Delia Albert. I, uh I'm a UP graduate. I took up foreign service, and that's why I joined the uh, diplomatic corps. After six, six, uh, 36 years, I became the first woman foreign minister in ASEAN. So perhaps that's my most distinguished uh, re uh, reference and the dist most distinguished alumna of UP 2012. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Dr. Oriarte. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ko. Uh, thank you, Edna. Uh, I've been associated with uh, ASEAN for uh, over 12 years. Uh, I was uh, a director for science and technology at the ASEAN Secretariat and then uh, director for functional cooperation. And uh, my latest uh, engagement uh, with ASEAN was as executive director of the uh, ASEAN Foundation. Of course, Orly and I were colleagues uh, in the cabinet of uh, President Strada. At saka may nakalimutan kang former na, former young man. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, yeah, the, the reason why I mean is that I'm not really an expert, but uh, I was the first uh, permanent representative of the Philippines to ASEAN after uh, the charter was implemented. Uh, there had to be a a permanent representative based in uh, in Jakarta, and I took up the task of uh, setting up the mission, and I think it was one of the most interesting jobs I've heard held. All right, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Albert, and uh, the two gentlemen, Dr. Oriarte and uh, Dr. Orly Mercado. Now let's come to the to the core issues of our today's uh, the platform. Many Filipinos are not quite aware of ASEAN, and this year we celebrate uh, the Philippines is the chair of the ASEAN, and I'd like to um, invite your opinion and uh, invite more discussions on uh, really talking about ASEAN. What is ASEAN? Can we begin from uh, Ambassador Albert? Well, I always begin by saying how to pronounce ASEAN. During my term in, as in the Department of Foreign Affairs, and I would lead delegations, if there were four Filipinos, there were four ways of pronouncing ASEAN. So let me get to that core message that to uh, pronounce it the same way that say 650 other million people do it, and it's ASEAN. Uh, we had some uh, discussion how it should even be pronounced. But uh, through the years, I think uh, we have gained some momentum. Uh, I think out of four different pronunciations, there would be only two now. So that's one thing. Perhaps it's important to uh, 
make the public aware that uh, the Philippines has been a major player in ASEAN <coughs> from day one. I was uh, secretary to Secretary Ramos, Narcisa Ramos, the father of President Ramos, when we prepared his briefing paper to go to Bangkok and sign and agree to the ASEAN Bangkok Declaration. This was a major move for the Philippines in our efforts to provide a public space where bilateral issues in the region could be addressed. If you recall our, our history, we have had some border problems with Malaysia, the same thing between Malaysia and Indonesia, and of course, Southern Thailand and Malaysia. And these efforts to try to address them were not moving in those years. So in 1967, after meeting for a countless number of consultations, and I, I was uh, very privileged to be part of arranging those consultations between Secretary Ramos and the rest of the foreign ministers. And uh, after agreeing, they moved on to Bangkok. Bangkok played a major role in getting the other participants like uh, Indonesia, Adam Malik, uh, the Philippines, of course, and Cesar Ramos, Singapore, Rajaratnam, uh, Thailand, of course, uh, Tanat Koman, and Tun Abdul Razak of Malaysia. But even before that, DFA had been initiating bilateral talks. I was part of a team that brought Tun Razak to Baguio to talk about how we could address the overlapping claims over uh, uh, Sabah. So the message is, I think, it was out of this fear of escalation of issues that these leaders decided, let's get together and band together and perhaps this way we could address these issues. For me, this is important to know how ASEAN came about. It was really the threat also that was coming from the north, uh, northeast, the, the ideological uh, competition in the region. And we were very keen that we should not be involved in them and that uh, uh, together, banding together, meant uh, a, a more uh, meaningful way to be able to address a lot of the ensuing issues that arose after our after independence, after colonialism. So I think one should remember that ASEAN was born out of this situation in the region. So uh, perhaps one has to look back and see, because with that, after 50 years, you can appreciate what we have achieved. There is general peace in the region, and that this has allowed these countries to progress economically. Okay, uh, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, which means that uh, to be able to understand ASEAN, it's important to have a historical context to its beginning. It's really a coming together of nations, of neighboring countries, to be able to uh, cooperate, to be able to achieve friendship among them and prevent a possible, you know, very critical issues that may probably challenge friendship. All right, so let me now uh, go on to uh, Dr. Oriarte. If you were to educate the regular Filipinos on ASEAN, I have to take the correct pronunciation now, learning from Ambassador Albert. If uh, one has to really put ASEAN and an understanding of ASEAN at the center of the Filipino mind. What is ASEAN? Well, uh, let me uh, first uh, concur with Ambassador Albert. No? Uh, whenever I hear on television or uh, during uh, conferences that ASEAN is being pronounced by Filipinos, even uh, very high officials as ASEAN, you know, I, I always, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I always feel, uh, you know, so disturbed, you know, because uh, it really means that, uh, you know, uh, they do not really know what ASEAN is really all about. As Ambassador Albert has mentioned, 
uh, the rest of the 600 million uh, other uh, uh, nationals uh, of ASEAN uh, uh, region pronounce it as ASEAN. But only Filipinos would pronounce it as ASEAN and ASEAN. You know? <laughs> so anyway, uh, what is ASEAN? Uh, this is your, your question and what can we do in order to uh, make it uh, more known to uh, more people? Well, ASEAN to me is still an evolving organization. 50 years ago, when ASEAN was established, it was a very loose organization. Uh, there were only five countries who uh, were members uh, at the founding of ASEAN, and uh, they did not even establish uh, a secretariat, a central secretariat. It was uh, loosely managed uh, by each individual country. And it took nine years before the very first ASEAN summit was held. Uh, and it was only at that time that they decided that a central secretariat will be necessary. Uh, and then it continued to evolve. Uh, the membership increased. Uh, first, Brunei was uh, admitted uh, into the organization, and then later on, uh, Vietnam. And in fact, I had uh, the opportunity to be uh, the very first team from the ASEAN secretariat to go to Hanoi in 1995 when they joined ASEAN. Uh, in order to, uh, to uh, provide uh, a series of seminars to the uh, government officials of, uh, of Vietnam on what ASEAN uh, was really all about. So at it that began time. with uh, working among government officials themselves. It was really just working among government officials. Uh, only government officials were actually involved. And then, of course, uh, as we know today, uh, it has evolved into uh, an ASEAN community. And by an ASEAN community, what is really meant by that is uh, that we are to be a single market and a single production base. That is the very core uh, of that concept of being, uh, of being an ASEAN community. The need to become an ASEAN community is actually driven by the fact that we need to be able to be competitive. We should be able to, be, we should be able to compete with India uh, which has over a billion uh, population. We should be able to compete with uh, China, which also has over a billion population. And with over 600 million population, I think ASEAN can do it. And even now that ASEAN is now a community, it still continues to evolve. Uh, we are aiming for centrality, for example, in our security, uh, security uh, arrangements. Uh, we aim to continue to uh, be competitive uh, with the rest of the world and we aim to have our own identity. This is very important. And this leads to the second part of your question. How do we promote that ASEAN identity? Uh, you know, when we did a survey, when I was executive director of the ASEAN Foundation, we did the survey among university students. These what are university students, the, the top universities in ASEAN countries. Yeah. And you will be surprised with the result, that the more advanced uh, economically, members of ASEAN were the ones who were not really aware about ASEAN. The newer members, surprisingly, like Laos, Lao PDR, Myanmar, Vietnam, were really more aware mm -hmm. of what ASEAN is really all about. Yeah. One of the things that we found out, for example, was one question that, we, that was posed by that survey uh, among university students was uh, the, the flags of all the 10 ASEAN countries were, were displayed. And the students were asked to match the names, to identify those flags. Mm -hmm. Which one is the flag of Myanmar? Which one is the flag of Lao PDR? So the very basic thing. The very basic thing. And surprisingly, uh, many students were unable to identify all the 10 flags of the 10 member countries. So we have still a long way to go in as far as establishing an ASEAN identity. So you mentioned about uh, countries coming together uh, to be able to survive and compete with the bigger players. We have to come together as ASEAN countries, uh, economically speaking, and you mentioned also about uh, identity. Uh, what about the political and the security aspect, Dr. Mercado? What is ASEAN and what does it have to do probably in the context of uh, the desire, the objective for political uh, for political cooperation and for security? Yeah, well, I, I'd like to answer that question, but before I go into that, I, you know, based on the study that was made by the ASEAN Foundation, I was already there in the first CPR, 
And it's precisely because of that study that we raised the question. It's the Philippines. We were the ones who raised the question. Do we have a strategic communication plan for ASEAN? Good point. Because the way, the way we, were, we were going, I felt, is that we were utilizing, we did not have a plan for the whole ASEAN, and we were utilizing basically the government uh, information agencies to be the conduit to spread uh, information about ASEAN. You know, remember, ASEAN is an intergovernmental organization. It is, uh, uh, it is very strong in the bureaucracy, that linkages are strong in the bureaucracy. But as far as people are concerned, it's, it's not felt. So when I, I kept talking about it for, for, <laughs> from the beginning, and until the, I think my colleagues got fed up already with me and they told me, we, we want that uh, strategic information because they were planning to have, how uh, to uh, get the services of a consultant. I said, you don't need a consultant, we just get together. He said, why don't you do it? Why don't you chair? I said, okay, yes. And so it's our mission that uh, crafted the draft of that communication, which how, uh, later on was approved up to the leadership in, uh, in the summit meeting. But the point there is that, as I said, they were relying on government uh, communication conduits. I was telling them, uh, the government communication uh, path is fine, but it doesn't have an audience. And there is some suspicion in countries like ours, where we have a very strong commercial-based mass media, it's going to be very difficult. So we, we try to overcome that, and now I, I don't know how well it is implemented now, but that's part of it. The other thing is that the activities that really relate to the people are not so well understood. I think now, with the rise of the economic community, you're going to, the people are beginning to feel what ASEAN is all about. You know, the, the fact that you go to the supermarket, the goods that you buy, uh, that you see, are largely from, from, from Thailand, from Indonesia, uh, and you are able to export. This thing uh, uh, moves us to a greater level of awareness. However, it is more than just economic. Uh, that's only a pillar, as we know. There are things that bind you together are a sense of identity. And that's in the third community, as we know. Now, the first community <laughs> that you mentioned, and, and because maybe I have a little experience in the defense department, uh, when you come to think of it, when ASEAN was born, the prevailing, uh, economic, the, the prevailing order there uh, was a situation wherein it, the world was bipolar. Uh, it was simple to identify. There was fear about the, do the dominoes began to fall in Asia, starting with, uh, and that's the reason why you have that Vietnam intervention and Vietnam War. Uh, there has been some allergy about talking about security issues, especially when you begin to uh, uh, think about it. it was the context in which it was born. However, things have changed already. Uh, it is no longer a bipolar world. And the countries that were supposed to be the first dominoes that would fall are now part of ASEAN. And this is a total sea change in terms of the context of, the, of ASEAN. And I think it is also part of, the, of how you can, as, as uh, June said, they are more aware of uh, ASEAN in these countries that are run by singular parties. And yet in a democratic setting like ours, it is something that is ignored. I mean, these things have to be taken into consideration. So you have different approaches in communication for the, the 10 members. It cannot be a one-size-fits-all communication uh, plan that ex is executed at that level. Uh, Dr. Mercado, you have mentioned about communication and things have changed between then and now. We should have better access to communication this time. And I'd like to bring back the question and the issue, the discussion on, as a communication person yourself, uh, what do you think of the awareness of the Filipinos on the ASEAN? 
Are you happy with it? Are Filipinos aware it's enough or aren't we aware enough of the ASEAN and what we have been talking about the benefits, the intent of the ASEAN, why we're coming together and all of this? But my, my, to... the, in, the, in the CPR, they thought I was joking, but I was serious when I told them. The first thing we can do, I said, was have something similar to that Euro uh, contest, that, that, uh, that entertainment contest, that singing contest, uh, Euro, Eurovision. I said, let's have something like that, like Eurovision. And they were joking me because, are you saying that because you Filipinos are very good in singing and dancing? No. I said, no, let's have something like that so that we have representatives and it's something that can be carried by the, all of the networks. I think uh, it should be one of, the, one of the big projects that we can establish and we can share our culture, etc. Then we begin to open the eyes of... With something like that, I guess, I guess the Filipinos will become aware of what ASEAN is all about when they begin to prepare for uh, Eurovision because you vote, right? you can vote in all of these countries and then you can have a champion. Maybe we can even win the first round. Uh, as in, uh, Dr. Uriarte, what do you think of awareness? What's the level of awareness and uh, of Filipinos, no? I mean, among us on the ASEAN? Yeah, the, the survey, uh, actually there have been uh, at least three surveys no, that uh, have been conducted uh, to determine the uh, awareness uh, of uh, uh, the people in ASEAN. And uh, the Philippines is at the lower uh, 50%. No? Uh, we are not at the bottom, but we are at the lower... But nearly, nearly at the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> We're nearly at yeah. the bottom. <laughs> but we are at the lower 50%. Uh, the, the, the issue there is that uh, the perception is that the country has not really benefited that much from its, uh, from its membership in ASEAN. Uh, and there might be some, uh, some uh, tinge of truth uh, to that, no? uh, at least relatively speaking. Uh, as I said, uh, in 1995, uh, when Vietnam joined, and uh, I was one of those who went there uh, in 1995. And uh, I could see that since 1995, uh, since joining ASEAN, they have actually uh, leveraged uh, tremendously their membership in ASEAN in order for them to attain certain centrality uh, in as far as security is concerned and, and most of all, competitiveness in as far as foreign direct investment is concerned. Uh, they have been able to, uh, to show to the world that uh, despite uh, historical facts, uh, we all know what, what, it, what it means, no? Uh, despite all of that, uh, their, uh, the uh, uh, Vietnam-US uh, uh, war, for example, uh, and yet, uh, because of the fact that they are a member of ASEAN, uh, then uh, foreign investors became uh, more at peace and more confident uh, in terms of uh, putting in their investment uh, into Vietnam. And they have been able to capitalize that. Now, look at again at Cambodia. You know, I have been to Cambodia before uh, they joined ASEAN, and I have visited also Cambodia many, many times. And that you can see that uh, Cambodia is developing uh, very, very rapidly. As I said, the awareness uh, of ASEAN in countries like Vietnam, Cambodia, and Lao PDR are very high. It's very high. Uh, and they are able to leverage. And that is, uh, I, to me, is a very important aspect. And these countries have a better uh, understanding and appreciation of what the regional uh, partnership is, is that your, is that your uh, I, I think, message? I think, no, what, what I think is that the leadership of these countries are able to leverage their membership in ASEAN in order to make their country appear to be an attractive uh, area for investment so that foreign direct investment ha has actually grown tremendously in these countries. And one of the factors for that is the fact that being a member of ASEAN 
and being able to show the world that they are part of this uh, grouping, yeah. which has, of course, attained a certain reputation in the international community, then investors feel confident of going into these countries in comparison to uh, a scenario wherein they are not a member of ASEAN. Probably uh, foreign direct uh, investors would be uh, more cautious in terms of putting in their investment into these countries. Right. Thank you very much. I'd like to solely throw this next question to Ambassador Albert. Having been an uh, ambassador, uh, I think 2017, no, this year, we are chairing the ASEAN. I'm aware now, it's the ASEAN. We're chairing the ASEAN. What is it for the Philippines? What is the role of the Philippines as, uh, as chair of the ASEAN? Ambassador? Perhaps before I <coughs> go into that, uh, answering that question, perhaps it's important to reflect on the 50 years of ASEAN. What has it achieved in so far as the Philippines is concerned. Uh, I recently had a meeting in, in the, to celebrate 40 years of ASEAN-EU relations. And I was asked, what have you really achieved in these past 50 years? Uh, of course, the EU is 60 years. And I said, let me premise this by telling you, we have learned from your mistakes. Yeah. Because there are certain things in the EU, in the beginning, we were thinking, wow, this is the model, uh, countries getting together, etc. But there are very big differences. But let me perhaps sum up what I think are the main achievements of ASEAN in the past 50 years. I have my little guidepost, like I was a student in UP. I would say, Anbaito, Siguro, four Cs. Four letter C. So what are the four C's? The four C's. One, we have achieved to come to agree to a charter. Yeah. To me, that's very important because in the beginning, as my, co my colleagues have said, it was a loose thing. We didn't want to commit, uh, etc. But when we decided to have a charter that gave a juridical personality to ASEAN, and it made us promise to adhere to the basic principles that gave birth the values of ASEAN. And it's a wonderful uh, piece of uh, document, uh, but I think it really needs to be tweaked after 50 years. Well, it, was, it didn't come in 50 years. The first is charter. I think that is a very big achievement. Uh, I remember when we were I was DG of ASEAN for the Philippines. Uh, we had difficulties getting commitments because people would say, yeah, you're not a legal entity, uh, etc." But I think the decision to have a charter was very, very crucial. <coughs> Second, the idea of a community. Yeah. The community uh, uh, issue, I remember the days when we were not allowed to use the word integration. It was a bad word. Again, because we didn't want to commit legally, we were not too certain if we can deliver. But 1992, we felt that the challenge of NAFTA on the uh, North American and the challenge of the European community, which we were looking at as Fortress Europe, made us feel that, hey, we better really get together and the first time I think integration came into the vocabulary was the idea of an economic community because that would be like the machinery that could bring about such integration. And I remember in, in uh, Singapore when we were discussing whether or not to finally uh, promote the letter, small letter C to big letter C that was a major political decision. But I think, again, it's these outside forces, NAFTA and EU, we did not want to feel left behind and that we should get together to, to, to face these uh, two for economic forces left and right. So you 
we talked for the first time of an ASEAN economic community. I remember how distinguished uh, 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 the, the Thai Prime Minister was in, in bringing it about. Also in ASEAN, you have to think who initiates this talk, because if it's initiated by somebody who cannot deliver, then nobody will believe it. But at that time, Thailand was doing well, and Kun uh, Panyarachun came out, uh, and uh, when uh, uh, Indonesia, the biggest uh, economy then, came out in support, they were very reluctant. But the idea that we had to really get together to face up to these two forces was very important. So you have charter, community. Third is, I think, connectivity. We have finally decided to connect not just physically, but institutionally, and get the people to be mobile and, and uh, work in each other's uh, places but with very, very strict conditions that you have to be highly skilled, etc. But the intention was there. So you have charter, community, connectivity. I think this is where the Philippines can uh, really gain a lot. If you look at the recent uh, inauguration linking Davao to Bitung in, in, in Indonesia, that was a very important link that really should be able to not just signify, but really substantiate right. what we mean by connecting with the rest of ASEAN. And that's very real. It's a very real, yes. And, and now also the, the, the uh, land-based or the, uh, what you call the uh, continental-based ASEAN have long been building roads. And, and that means a lot when you can drive easily from one capital to the other or get on a... Uh, Orient Express and, and move from Singapore to Kuala Lumpur, etc. That means a lot. So, charter, uh, community, connectivity, and the uh, latest, which I think is very important, is what uh, our uh, Orly has said on centrality. Yeah. We have gained such a momentum in terms of our importance as a player in the region. Therefore, we have been quite uh, effective in ma maintaining that it is not just ASEAN that we should be connecting with, but with our dialogue partners. Uh, we have what you call the uh, 10 plus 1 or 10 plus 3. 10 plus 3 is very important for me. It means linking the 10 ASEAN countries to China, Japan, and Korea. I think that was a master stroke of ASEAN. Why? Well, for one thing, when I used to organize uh, golf tournaments, I said, huwag lang ASEAN, plus three, magaling yung Hapon at saka yung, yung, yung Korean. Mananalo tayo niyan. In the end, it is ASEAN who won. You know, but still, we held the central position. We uh, not only set the agenda, of course, we, had, we were open to their agenda as well. So I, I, I believe that in these 50 years, there has been a lot achieved. And to me, what's important, and you talked about communication, is to make sure that these achievements or these plans cascades to the people of ASEAN. And for our 50th anniversary, I was very pleased that the first <coughs> uh, theme was people-oriented, people-focused ASEAN. Of course, there are others, but if we can only achieve people-focused, people-centered, people-oriented ASEAN, I think we can make people feel ownership of this fantastic organization, which, by the way, uh, in the latest book of uh, Kishore Mabubani, calls it the ASEAN miracle. Yeah. How we manage to get where we are today yeah. is something that should be awarded by the Nobel Peace Prize, according to him. But anyway, that's uh, one person thinking about it. But why not? Um, but I think what's important now is the, to have the people of ASEAN feel that they are part of a bigger whole and not just an island somewhere. Uh, being a maritime country, 
makes it a little bit more difficult perhaps because we are not, yeah. unless we have this uh, connectivity in terms of uh, airports, airlines, uh, we have, but so is Indonesia. Uh, there are 15,000 islands, we are only 7,000. So that is something we, we really have to be able to manage. Um, recently, or two years ago, in the Ramon Magsaysay Award, I was very keen to uh, give my vote to a woman, uh, Ligaya Amilbangsa. When we interviewed her, you know, she made popular a dance of Sulu. It's called Pangalay. And she said in our interview, I want to pr promote this dance because it underscores our ASEAN-ness. And I felt these are the ways we can really uh, put a face, a name, uh, a dance to an identity which uh, June mentioned about developing that, that, that identity that we, we belong to something bigger than ourselves. And I'm, I'm very glad that uh, these movements in Mindanao, uh, in spite of what's happening there, I remember President Ramos always saying that we should develop Mindanao, that it should be a front door to our neighbors in ASEAN. And this has happened with this uh, 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 Roro yeah. from Davao to Bitung. So there are many ways to uh, manifest our uh, being part of a bigger uh, community than ourselves. So I think that the uh, focus of the 50th anniversary, one of them, as I said, was to be people-focused, people-oriented. And uh, for this, I'd like to s talk about what I have organized uh, to bring down, cascade what is happening on the official front to the public. We have organized together with President Ramos as our chairman, a group called the ASEAN Society, where we invite and this is a formal invitation. Everyone who has done work in ASEAN to be part of it, and UP is going to play a major role. Sure. So thank you so much. Okay. So I think uh, having said that, although we are saying maybe the efforts are not enough yet to create the awareness and the actual commitment to ASEAN, in the Philippines, but you have mentioned that you have cited uh, a good number of these efforts towards connectivity, despite being an island, which is a challenge, really. Now, my last question is going to be, uh, I'd like to hear from, from each one of you, what more efforts do we need to build up and what more efforts do we need to exert to be able to really strengthen our ASEAN-ness, our commitment to ASEAN, to be really integral part of it. And moreover, because we are chair currently of the ASEAN, what more efforts do we see uh, that we need to, you know, to be more upbeat, to push forward, to, to be a bit more pushy about it? What is it that we need uh, to do in the Philippines? Do you wish to... Does well, anyone, I, yeah. I would like to Dr. come Mercado. in and say something about that. There's no denying that the 50 years have achieved a lot. According, appropriate to the era uh, that has passed. Unfortunately, uh, things have changed. It was born, ASEAN was born during the time prior. This is pre-information communication technology. The speed and velocity with which things are happening and how decisions are made is totally different. I cannot understand why ASEAN up to this day still follows the consensus of having to wait for everybody to agree or if one disagrees, there is no agreement. Now, in the, in the book that was published, ASEAN, uh, the ASEAN Drama, Drama. ASEAN, which you edited, and June and I had a chapter's contribution. By the way, I made my contribution on time. I'm not, I, I was not, take note of that. I was not the late that. one. Yes. <laughs> but kidding aside, I have raised that particular issue and gotten into a, 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 a study 
looking at the history and why it came about. I, I, I will not discuss that chapter uh, anymore, except to say that I believe it is high time and it is appropriate uh, now that the, the chairmanship is in the Philippines and we have a leader who is a disruptive innovator. For us to innovate and disrupt the way we decide in ASEAN. And there is basis for this. There is actually not only a basis, there is a need for it. And I hope that uh, President De Gong will champion this and uh, hopefully uh, uh, get this. You know. Now, I, I argue my case in this particular chapter, and I hope that uh, uh, we can provide a copy to the Secretary of Foreign Affairs for his consideration. Actually, that's a good way to advertise our book, the book that UP had published recently, ASEAN Drama, uh, half a century and still unfolding. Thank you very much. Dr. June Oriarte. Yes, uh, let me divide. Uh, your, your question is, uh, what more can we do? No? Let me divide it into the three uh, areas of cooperation in ASEAN. In uh, political and security cooperation, uh, I think this is proceeding quite well. But what we need to do here is to be able to really have a leader in ASEAN. Uh, we have lost uh, that kind of a leadership uh, in ASEAN. Uh, during the early days of ASEAN, uh, we all know that uh, Indonesia uh, was uh, uh, playing that role of leadership. Right now, you look at all the 10 ASEAN countries, nobody is playing a leadership role. We are chair, but we need to uh, do something in order to uh, play a leadership role. So that, to me, is what is lacking in the uh, political and security uh, area. In the economic area, uh, the plan for the uh, ASEAN economic community is all laid out. What is sorely lacking there is the development of a dispute settlement mechanism. Uh, when you have full economic cooperation, uh, there will be times wherein certain countries will not be able to meet certain obligations uh, in order to make the field level. Uh, and they will have uh, an edge. Uh, and therefore, there will be a dispute between countries. We, do, we don't have that yet. Uh, it's still evolving, but that is one of the most important uh, uh, elements that would need to be addressed to be able to put in place a dispute settlement mechanism. And that will require uh, a strengthening of the ASEAN Secretariat. In order to be able to uh, have an objective uh, dispute settlement mechanism, it will have to be done by an independent uh, body, not by the member countries themselves. Third, in the uh, uh, socio-cultural area, uh, what we need there really is to be able to communicate what ASEAN is all about in as far as the peoples of ASEAN are concerned. Let me give you an example. Many people are still wondering whether you can drive in other ASEAN countries. They don't know that that has been long been approved. I was uh, part of the ASEAN Secretariat uh, since 1986 when uh, there were only 14 officers in the ASEAN Secretariat. And even at that time, there was already an agreement for a common mutual recognition of, uh, of driving license. And yet, you go and try to drive in, in Thailand. Even I, uh, I had to get a driver's license in, in, in Indonesia. And in fact, an international driver's license was, uh, was uh, even more useful. In uh, other words, it's not totally seamless. It's not totally seamless, and it's also not known. Uh, you, you drive with a Philippine license in Thailand and say, well, the police will just not uh, recognize your Philippine license. And yet there was an agreement. And there is a, there's an inherent weakness in implementing agreements within ASEAN. The problem is, even if there is already an agreement, for example, uh, the most recent now are the MR, um, MRAs, the mutual recognition uh, arrangements, in, in terms of mutual recognition of 
professional uh, degrees. The problem there is that even if ASEAN has already agreed, there is still need for individual countries to negotiate bilaterally in order to be able to implement an ASEAN agreement. That is one of the most, uh, that will have to be addressed. Uh, and a solution will have to be found. Now, if we are able to do that, then uh, many, of the, uh, many of the things that we are trying to implement within ASEAN uh, could then be felt by the people themselves, like mutual recognition of driving license. If this can be felt by the people who are traveling within ASEAN, this are real for ordinary. then it's a real thing that, you know, ASEAN is here, you know. The other one, uh, the, the, uh, Ambassador Albert mentioned uh, a little bit earlier, the fact that we are able to travel with no visa, and yet that has not been amended for such a long time. It's still 14 days. No, no, 30 days. Thir yeah, some can't, yeah, 30 days now. Uh, but it could be three months. Yeah. If you are a businessman, you probably would need uh, to stay three months uh, uh, in a country. Or if you are, uh, uh, no. So uh, these are the kind of things that would need to be done in order for uh, the people to be able to feel actually the difference between being individual countries and being part of ASEAN. And when they start feeling this, then I believe that this uh, identity, this ASEAN, this ASEAN-ness, this being able to uh, feel that you are part of ASEAN will be more readily uh, recognized by the peoples in this region. Brilliant insights, comments, and suggestions, Dr. Uriarte. Nevertheless, the woman has the final say to answer to the, this question. May I invite uh, Ambassador Albert, what she thinks about this? What needs to be done some As a more? woman, I'm a pragmatic person. You have identified a lot of the successes, the issues, the problems, yet we have not really felt the impact. For this reason, as I said earlier, I felt that the mindset in ASEAN is in silos. The political and security people think one way in, in, in their, within their own group. I call it incestuous. And then the second group of economic, even if they're talking economic, they have to know what's going on in terms of the strategic issues that are present and being discussed in the political security and the people doing work on the social cultural have to know what are the commitments made in these two other communities and so i've turned local i've turned pragmatic and say why don't we get a group or an open space a public space where the three silos could meet and discuss regularly uh, how do people know in, 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 in far-flung places that they can go without a visa? Why? Because these are not being discussed. This is not being communicated. There is not even a page on ASEAN in our newspapers. You open the nation. You open the Straits Times. You open, everything that's happening in ASEAN is there. They read about it. I... I was so disappointed when I came back. I said, oh, where's the ASEAN page? I want to know what's going on. There is not a newspaper that really tells you this was the decision of the, uh, the uh, last meeting of the ASEAN Regional Forum, for example. How, how will people know that these things are happening? It does not get fed into the people whose lives are affected by this. So we, were, we felt that with this ASEAN society, we can get the people working on the three pillars to sit down, dialogue, converse, and perhaps this way we can create that awareness that things are happening, but things could be improved. And, and, and on the issue of consensus, uh, the ASEAN focus of the uh, Institute of uh, Southeast Asian Studies in, in Singapore just came out with a, an issue on what 
people think about consensus. And uh, I, my contribution was ASEAN has come to a point to be matured enough to realize that consensus is a difficult, and I, although it's ideal, we'll try everything to, to do it, but look at the AEC, ASEAN Economic Community. They have devised what they call ASEAN minus X. So if that country is not prepared or not able to, to say, uh, uh, clean up the customs or are unable to provide the customs forms on time, etc., etc. This is very complicated with the ASEAN economic community. And that's why they have agreed to a, a formula that would say, okay, if 10 don't agree and 2 don't, we will say it gets approved, it's 10 minus 2 or 10 minus X. I, I, I think that has been helpful insofar as the ASEAN economic community uh, uh, agreements uh, are, are concerned. But I, I, I would like to think that the, the Philippines, uh, someone said, how do, we, how do we try to understand everybody? I said, learn Bahasa, because it's spoken by four countries. Perhaps it would matter. But we already are speaking the official language of ASEAN. It should not be a problem for us to access all the decisions, all the th thought leadership that has come out of ASEAN to share with the rest of the population. I think our educational system has a lot to be desired in terms of being able, I don't know if we have complied with the textbook, I don't know if we have complied with what we promised ages ago to include in the curriculum. Uh, and. I think we have a lot of homework to do before we go out and say, yeah, but they're not doing this, they're not doing that. I think we have a homework to do. As an island, as a maritime ASEAN, we have a very uh, crucial role in, in, in making sure that ASEAN uh, is, is with us in terms of our at least, if you look at our foreign policy, perhaps this is something we can work on. But beyond foreign policy, beyond political, economic, social, I think all this silo mentality should get together. Because you will understand why certain things happen if you know that in, in ARF or in the uh, uh, defense minister's meeting, these things were happening. So. I still want, would like to see a, a column in the newspapers. I, I don't know how many people read newspapers, but I think it makes a lot of difference. When you go to Bangkok, you open, there's an ASEAN page in Nation. Very, very well written articles. And I think UP has contributed a lot, contributed a lot to the thinking and thought leadership. It should be made more public. And perhaps in August, we can have this uh, event to introduce to the public what we have done. And after all, we, UP is part of the ASEAN University Network. Uh, uh, but I came from Iloilo recently, and I talked about ASEAN. And uh, I won't tell you what I found out. But anyway, I, I felt that uh, we need a lot of uh, more work to do within the country itself because a lot has been prepared uh, and we can even advise our leaders who go, hopefully they will listen to the uh, uh, conferences, to the meetings and uh, it's, it's, it's uh, in very important that leaders should listen also to the people and what they are uh, experiencing and what they would like to see as a member of that uh, ASEAN community with a letter, big letter C. Okay, uh, thank you very much for those insights, but probably very quickly, just for a line or two maybe from each one, would like to hear the core message that you wish to, to leave with our uh, viewers and with our, uh, with our listeners on Philippines and the ASEAN. Uh, just very quickly, uh, Dr. Mercado, well, as far as I'm concerned, uh, ASEAN has done a lot for our country and has done a lot for the region. 
but it's high time we do away with the ASEAN way, wherein everybody has to agree with, uh, uh, on, the, on an issue before it's implemented. Thank you. Dr. Oriarte. Yeah, we have an excellent opportunity uh, now, being uh, the chair of ASEAN uh, during its 50th anniversary. We have a young uh, foreign uh, secretary at this time. Uh, I said that uh, it's about time that, uh, again, at least w one of the countries should really uh, be able to provide uh, the needed leadership uh, within ASEAN, and the Philippines should uh, be able to uh, uh, use that opportunity of its chairmanship to really uh, provide that leadership and uh, then uh, propose uh, these uh, uh, changes uh, in ASEAN in order for it to be really and truly become a community. And one of these most important things that I feel that the Philippines should, uh, should, should propose is really the strengthening of the ASEAN Secretariat uh, because that is where the dispute settlement mechanism will have to be held, will have to be housed, and also a strengthened uh, ASEAN Secretariat should be able to uh, provide uh, the needed uh, dissemination of the right information to all its uh, member countries. Thank you. And finally, once again, uh, I would like to emphasize the need for dialogue between the people of the country, when you say people, everybody, and leadership. Uh, after all, it's the leaders that bring what the country wants out of ASEAN. So consistent dialogue in terms of what should be delivered by leadership is a very important uh, message because unless the idea of ASEAN is understood and accepted by the people, the students, the, the business people, I don't think we can really feel that ASEAN-ness that we are striving for. So dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. Okay, thank you very much for uh, those wonderful, very rich, and very substantive uh, sharing, discussion, comments, and recommendations. A critique to a certain extent, but also an appreciation of what ASEAN has been, an appreciation of what we're doing and struggling with as uh, Philippines being a member of the ASEAN and also as currently the chair. But I also get the message that this moment, this year, as we chair the ASEAN, we look forward to how hard we should strive to be more connected to each other, to be able to work and struggle with our own homework, doing our own bit as a country, as chair, and also to drum beat some more the ASEAN and what its value is, not only for the Philippines, but for the rest of the region in the ASEAN and the ASEAN plus. Plus. So with this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me thank again our panelists who have been wonderful, very insightful, and we cannot have any better experts and guests than those we have today. Thank you very much for this, and we look forward to uh, listening to you continuously and engaging with you in various forms and efforts in a dialogue on the ASEAN. Good day and uh, have a wonderful day, everyone. For the TVUP, this is Dr. Edna Ko of the University of the Philippines.